Hello and welcome to the Odds Checker betting show. It is, in my opinion, one of the greatest weeks of sport. Not only do we have the Masters starting tomorrow, but of course the Grand National Meeting at Aintree gets underway on Thursday. And we are here to preview that. I'm your host, George Ellick, and I'm delighted to be joined by Andy Holding. Andy, I think it's tradition that in our Aintree previews, I start by asking you, who wins the Masters? Um... Yeah, I, I think this year's um, event is obviously dominated by Scotty Schofer, who, you know, I think he's had about a four to one shot now. He could easily run away with it, couldn't he? I think we're all under that. No illusions there. Um, but obviously, with a lot of firms betting 10 places, et cetera, et cetera, I, I thought two guys that played the track well uh, and coming in good for Jander Schofle and um, Matsuyama, either one of those two, ran about sort of 14, 16 and won the pair. Hopefully, one of those two will give me a decent spin. What about yourself? Yeah, don't hate the chance of either of those two. I, I'm I'm going to blow my trumpet now, and I've been backing Siwoo Kim about 150, 140 to one for the last couple of weeks, and he's now I think 50 to one, 66 to one. So that'll be a good result. Cameron Young as well, I think, is a huge price. He's like he's bigger than he was last year, and since then he finished seventh last year. He's I think come in the top ten in four of the last uh, seven majors. So he's another one that I'm looking at. I think. It's quite fun having Sheffield at the top of the market because suddenly everyone else is a bit bigger uh, kind of elsewhere. So anyway, we'll see. But we're not here to talk about golf, although we could for a while. <laughs> we are here to talk about Aintree. And uh, we're recording this just after one o'clock on Wednesday. So racing gets underway in just over 24 hours. We're going to rattle through the Thursday card here today before we reconvene tomorrow. And myself, Andy and Ed Quigley will be going through the card on Friday. And of course, on Grand National Day on Saturday as well. So do keep your eyes peeled for those episodes as well. But we didn't want to leave Thursday uncovered. And that's why Andy has joined me for a quick uh, tour through the cards. I'm going to be going through the odds checker grids. Um, this is where you'll find the best prices, the best bookie offers, free bets, place terms, and Andy's tips straight to the app every single morning of racing. I'm uh, going to kick off in the 145, Andy. Uh, the novice chase, uh, just over two and a half miles. And Grey Dawning is the even money favourite ahead of Ginny's Destiny at seven to two. Ilete Tomp is a four to one. Blow your wad, 10 to one. Colonel Harry is 33 to one. And this is Grey Dawning and uh, Ginny's Destiny going head to head yet again after their battle at Cheltenham. I mean, hard to make a case, is it, for, for these two to, to reverse the form? But the price is... Where do you see the value? Um, first thing to say before we kick off, George, is, is the ground is going to be pretty testing there at Aintree. Mm. I know they're calling it soft, heavy in places on the Marme and probably do the way around on the national course. But a good friend of mine lives virtually um, with Aintree over his back fence. And he said it started raining around about half past seven this morning and it still hasn't stopped. And that was at quarter to one. So... Whatever, they, whatever they've whatever they got, they've got some more on top of it, probably more than what they were hoping for. And as we know, that Marmay track does take some getting, particularly the hurdle course, as we saw um, over the Christmas um, period, that they, they were finishing on their hands and knees. So it's going to be survival of the fittest. So not necessarily all races will, and the form will hold up just because it's more arduous and a, a different type of horse might win it. Or if horses have had really hard races at Cheltenham, and then they're asked to do it again, sort of two, three, four weeks on. They might not have the constitution to do. But as it stands, I mean, Grey Dawning is the best horse in this division. Um, he's actually proven over further, so that's going to come in handy. You'd imagine that whatever happens here, he'd outstage in his destiny, barring accidents, as he did at Cheltenham. He probably would have beaten Ginny's destiny as well at Cheltenham at the previous meeting when he made that bad mistake at the second last. It, effectively, he's two for two over Ginny's destiny. So the, the, the only sort of um, fly in the ointment is Zilete Tomp, who looked for all the world as though he was outpaced in, in the Arkle before staying on belatedly to finish third. I think he was sort of seventh or eighth coming down the hill and flat to the boards. Just couldn't go at the speed of the, the likes of Gaelic Warrior, etc. Um, but he did keep on well. And over two mile three at um, Limerick over the Christmas period, he also ran a big number that day behind the aforementioned uh, Gaelic Warrior. The two races um, I've just mentioned there, the Arkle and the Turners, were almost identical on the numbers, and and they were the second and third fastest times respectively behind the Gold Cup that we got all week. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a flip of the coin, really, which which way you go um, with mm. this race. Um, 
There's an argument to say that Ilete Tonk could be a little bit of value without Ginny's destiny um, on the basis that they, you know, the step up in trip and the arc of form is just as good. Or the other horse to mention as well at a big price, and this is the bet I'm probably going to be looking at just from a value stance, is Colonel Harry, who finished sixth in the Turners. But it was Cheltenham's very much a, uh, a track, particularly on the new course, that lends itself to front runners. And he was last going out onto, onto the final circuit. Uh, horses like Iroko and Fasal Vega, they were all languishing out the back as well. Never got in it. The, virtually they were the first first three home were one, two, three throughout. So I tend to upgrade horses that run well from the back of the field. Uh, and Colonel Harry, actually, his, his individual circuit time was not a million miles off the likes of Great Dornan and Ginny's Destiny in isolation. So with only five runners, they're going to be racing more in a huddle, more in a pack. Colonel Harry will only be sort of three or four lengths behind um, this time rather than sort of 10, 15 lengths behind. And we know that he loves heavy ground. All, all his best form this season, and as a novice herder, were on heavy ground. The yards now come back into form. They went a little bit quiet during the at Cheltenham week. Uh, he's 33 to 1 in the win only market, but he's 11 to 1 without grey dawning. I think he'll definitely beat Blow Your Wad. I can't understand why he's uh, a, a, three times the price of, of Blow Your Wad because Blow Your Wad's only running handicaps and Colonel Harry's running loads of grade ones. So. Yeah, I, I, I think it, look, I just think he's a smidgen of value. I'm not saying it's definitely going to come off this bet, but um, it's probably uh, it's probably got more chance of coming off than the odds imply. Put it that way. That's all we can ask for, Andy. We're here to we're here for value, and value twelve to one. Colonel Harry in the without grey dawning market <clears throat> absolutely is. Uh, that is with William Hill eleven to one the Sky Bet as well. Uh, just a couple of firms out with that. I'm guessing more firms will come out with that market over the next kind of 12 hours or so. So keep your eyes peeled. But 12 to 1 is the best price there as it stands, the outsider of the five, but in with the, without the favourite market. On to uh, the juvenile huddle now over an extended two miles. And Sergino, having missed the Cheltenham Festival, having bludgeoned a lot of people's antipost position uh, in the triumph after after Nicky's horses, obviously we're not in a great uh, place. Then is the five to six favourite? Favourite ahead of um, Card Jess at seven to two, who was runner up in the uh, in the triumph, and then we've got Khalif to Burley at six to one, uh, Nurburgring at ten to one, Enteloto at sixteen to one, and Dirty Den at one hundred and fifty to one. So a few angles here with regards to the to the triumph. Nurburgring was a, a horse you were very keen on ahead of the festival and ran with credit. How do you see this market now? Yeah, I'll get on to Nurburgring in, in a second or two. Um, but let's just deal with the favourite, the facts that we've got um, in front of us. He was roughly this kind of price going into the Cheltenham Festival. Then obviously he, along with many other stable stars, were withdrawn because of all those issues that Nicky Anderson had in the build-up and indeed the week of the Cheltenham Festival itself. And now we've been asked to take the same price, um, not knowing if there's a, a massive upsurge in, in the yard's fortunes. They've had one runner since it's won, easy peasy, but they've been very quiet. Only, I think he's only had four, four runners in the last fortnight. So this is a bit of a suck it and see exercise here, here, mm. here, here really. Um, added to the f- fact that it's going to be heavy on the hurdles course. I know he's won all toy on softest ground, but they, they, it's always soft or heavy in the going description all toy, even though sometimes, it, it, let's say in the spring period, it dries out to perhaps be a lot quicker than what the official game description tells you so i think that's a little bit of a red herring this is going to be a right slog and if, if he's got like even a five percent or ten percent issue with his um uh you know sort of like his, his, his internal organs or whatever you know his, his lungs or, or whatever that problem was that nicky henderson had mm. th- this will find him out um ultimately i just couldn't go anywhere near him at the price he might well win and prove us all wrong but it's all about the prices and what you're prepared to back and the risks involved. And I think he comes with a um, a, a big big wealth warning over him. The best form is definitely the, the triumph. It always has been. And this is one of the races, actually, that stands the test of time. Some of the races, like the Fox Hunters, another race who I'll talk about, they tend to come with horses who come here fresh. But the triumph hurdles, um, the biggest trial, the best trial for this race, they seem to be able to take that race and come here and uh, move on, no problem. Carguess was an honourable second to um, Mar- Mar- Marge Brew. It was a it was a strongly run race. It was much the winner strongly... for for a while. That, that he did, yeah. Stretch. I mean, she did. I mean, she travelled great. I thought I was going to win going out the last. I put the mm. two up at Carguess and Nurburg ring up. Uh, they got contrasting rides, and Carguess just faltered at the last. She made a bit of a mistake. Didn't get up the hill. 
and ultimately she was just out to stay. But the, the time was good, much better than the county hurdle, the older horses uh, won by absurd. So I think it was a good triumph this year. So we know that she stays a strongly run two miles well. Um, I think the flatter track will suit. She's, I think she'll still be going as well as anything down to the last. It's just whether she gets home on that long run in on testing ground. I think she's value at seven to two. And I do think Nürburgring has got to be factored into the equation. I think arguably Nürburgring got one of the worst rides of the whole Cheltenham Festival. JJ Slevin, I'm not sure what instructions he had going out there, but he either took it on himself to drop the horse right out the back door. And I mean, probably about 15, 20 lengths off the speed, which just didn't make sense on a horse that raced prominently at Leopardstown the time before, raced prominently when winning at Fairy House the time before that. And it, I just don't know what he was thinking. Um, at no stage did that horse have any chance of, of um, going with the main players. It was to his great credit that he managed to salvage something from the wreckage and finish fourth, a creditable one at that. So with only six runners this time, and I'm sure he's going to get a, a much more positive ride, um, I would say Nürburgring is, again, a horse certainly to consider at his current odds. I think he's a better than a 10 to one shot. So I'm going to play the two against the field. I'm going to stick the try and fertile form. Hope Sergino doesn't quite um, live up to expectations. Um, and yeah, seven to two and 10 to one respectively. They'll do for me. Lovely stuff. Yeah. Seven to two car Jess is with bet three, six, five bet Victor Coral and a couple of others, a uh, Nürburgring 10 to one. That's with three, six, five Hills. Uh, Bet Victor and Ladbrokes. Uh, on to the 255, the third race on the card, uh, the Bowl, now the William Hill Bowl Chase, where Jerry Colom off a valiant effort at Cheltenham is a 7-4 to four favourite. Shishkin, who of course missed Cheltenham uh, for previous reasons, discussed 3-1, to one. Corbett's Cross, Cheltenham winner. Four to one, Brave Man's Game ten to one, Ahoy Senor twelve to one, Gentleman's Game twenty five to one, thirty five to one, Thunder Rock seven run here, Andy. Yeah, Shiskin, um, obviously he's the champion from last season. Um, he was brilliant that day. That was Shiskin at his absolute maximum capacity. Um, this track obviously suits him, and um, if it wasn't for the Gold Cup, we, we would have seen whether he could have beaten the likes of Jerry Colong and, and uh, Galapand de Champ. Um, four, four weeks ago, but he's going to get his chance to um, make amends here. But, you know, he he does face a horse and an opponent in the shape of Jerry Colomb that not only ran his face off in the Gold Cup, but also won in very stylish fashion here last year when he won the Marmaid Novices. So you've got two course and distance winners from last season, head to head, front end of the market. Me personally, I think Jerry Colomb might just hold sway. Um, I mean, he's had a fairly light campaign. I know he had a fairly hard race in the Gold Cup, but at least he finished his race off strongly. I watched a video back again this morning, and unlike the likes of Kyrick Rambler and, and Lom Press, who were literally crawling up the hill, he actually went up, you know, and, and chased uh, Gallop Anderson really strongly all the way to the line. So, arguably, fitness, you know, could be could be actually in his favour rather than against him. Uh, whereas Shiskin hasn't had a run for 61 days, which might have a, a little bit of a detrimental effect. The, the real sort of Unknown quantity at this level is Corbett's Gross. Um, I actually think coming here is an easier option than taking on the novices. He could have run in the two and a half. He could have run in the three miles, but he'd be up against Grey Dawn and in Ginny's Destiny. He'd be up against a whole bunch of quality horses in the three mile novice race as well. But if you take away Joe Colombo Shiskin, I don't think you're left with a lot here. Mm. Hoy Senor is just not the same horse he has been last season or the year before. Rayman's game didn't stay in the Gold Cup. He didn't handle the ground. He's not going to handle the ground or stay here. Gentleman's game was pulled up in the Gold Cup. I, I couldn't have him on my mind. And Thunder Rock, I don't think it's good enough. So, like I say, I think this is a good, wise move by Emma Mullins and, and JP coming here. He was one of the most stylish winners of the, at the Cheltenham Festival. He didn't even, he almost didn't come out of second, third gear. So, he didn't have a hard race. Um, three miles on heavy ground, he's absolutely bang on for him. I actually think he's probably the biggest danger to Jerry Colong than Shiskin. So, again, I'll probably fiddle around with either Corbett's Cross in the outright market, around about 7 to 2, 4 to 1, or maybe just take slightly shorter rods and, and get him perhaps to finish second to Jerry Colong. One way or the other, I think that's that, that's the way I go. I'd, my, my angle of approach there in the, in the, in the bowl. Yeah, Corbett's Cross is 4-1 to one with BetMGM and BetUK, 7-2 to two basically across the board. <clears throat> so keep an eye out on there. Um, there is a without Jerry Colon market as well, where Corbett's Cross is 2-1 to one with that victor, kind of 15-8. Yeah. to eight. 
Um, so one of those two, the way to play it, according to to Andy. Uh, on to the entry hurdle now. Uh, over two and a half miles, Bob Ollinger is the six to four favourite ahead of Impere Pass at 15 to eight. Langadan, nine to one. Lashia, 12 to one. And Nimi and Lyon, 14 to one. Marie's Rock, 16 to one. 70 to one Beacon's Edge and 100 to one uh, Mines Glory. Uh, we had Johnny Wards on Racing Weekly earlier in the week saying that Empere Pass was his best of the week and um, saying that he wasn't sure if Bob Ollinger would go off Fav. Thoughts on, on Johnny's thoughts there, Andy? I think a lot depends, doesn't it, George, what Empere Pass turns up. I, I don't think he's the horse that we all thought and Connection thought would turn out to be so far this season. I think that's a fair assessment of him. I mean, he look, he's run well. I mean, he's been up against State Man and, and some top-class two-milers all season. They were obviously trying to make him a champion hurdle horse. That didn't quite materialise. So I think it's not a bad um, option or, or point of the season to again try him out over, over two and a half again. I mean, he stayed it well enough in the hands of grace early on in the season. Um, he just looked a, a little bit reluctant last time. His jumping was a bit poor. He just didn't look himself for one reason or another. Um, so it's it's off the back of that run that you trust Willie Mullins to get him back mentally more than anything else uh, to the horse that we saw last year when he was when he was winning the um, when he was winning the Ballymore. So I can see Johnny's argument, um, and if he's on his A game, the numbers that we've got, he's unbeatable in this race. He's got three times way superior than Bob Ollinger, but they were at his absolute peak. Mm. It's just whether he is at his absolute peak or, he's, like I say, he's just not quite with it. Um, and if if he's not, then obviously Bob Ollinger will take advantage of that. This has been his target pretty much all season. They did talk with the idea of Cheltenham, maybe running him in the champion hurdle because obviously that race cut up, but they decided to run Irish Point. And then Rob Core, of course, had Tiapu uh, as their um, standalone Stays hurdle horse, so there's no need for him to try to go up to three miles. But as we saw at Navin early on the year in Cheltenham when he beat Marie's Rock on heavy ground, he's still got that silky smooth way of going about the, his business and, and sort of like stamping his authority and class on proceedings when, you know, he's in the mood. And he, he's very much in the mood and in the ascendancy, whereas in Pere Pass, we, we're just not quite sure. So it's a really difficult conundrum, this one. Do you go with Impede Pass and hope that he comes back to those numbers that he did last season and beyond Tiupu? Or do you go with the the, um, the less riskier option, let's say, with, with Bob Ollinger? So it's not as if like one's even money and the other one's three to one and we say, well, we'll go the th- with the three to one. I think they're going to be virtually identical as cl- close to the off, sort of 13 to eight each or two. So I'd probably go with Bob Ollinger, like I say, just because I think he's guaranteed to run his race um that might come back to bite me in the bum but um that, that's the way i'll see it just siding with bob ollinger six to four yeah. best price as it stands at the moment that is with william hill as i say in Perry pass 15 to 8 but seven or four kind of across the board will be interesting to see how that develops and of course langer dan um who was the the villain's hero i don't, I don't know how we say it really after the festival triumph um having shown little form over the course of the year but going back to back at the festival uh taking on bob ollinger and imperi pass at nine i'll be stunned i'll be stunned if that won by the way yeah, so absolutely I. stunned i mean i don't think the ground's going to be anywhere near in his favor he's only a little horse um you know it's all right winning a cold cup but taking on two genuine grade one horses i that would have almost been the training performance of the season. If, if, if <laughs> it would also it would also call um, bring some performances between the two festivals under even more scrutiny. Would <laughs> I think? Just a bit, just a <laughs> bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on to the Fox Hunters now in the 405, and it's on the line. And Spyglass Hill, the two nine to two joint favourites. Animex is five to one. Time Leader is thirteen to two. Benny's King, seventeen to two. Romeo Magico, ten to one. Uh, Gaboriot. Uh, Gabriel Wright is 11 to 1, 25 to 1 bar those. Loads in here, Andy. 22 runners as it stands. Most firms going five places. Betway going seven places. Um, how do you see this? Yeah, un- unlike the, the the sort of fox hunters at the, the Cheltenham Festival and the cross country race to a degree um, at the Cheltenham Festival, a lot of punters tend to shy away from these kind of events. And I do really. I don't really take them that seriously as betting mediums. But I actually really like this one just because we've got the added spice of the, of the fences, of course. 
Um, I've got a fairly fairly reasonable record in this race. I'm, I'm hoping to nail the winner again. My first starting point is to try and go with horses that have missed the Cheltenham Festival. Um, year in, year out, horses that run and run there, either won it or finished in the first four. They're always priced up because they're, you know, they're running the best race. They're, they've got the best form, basically. But it means nothing because they've had such a hard race over three mile two. Asking them to come back in trip to two and a half miles or two five, uh, albeit on heavy ground, is... I wouldn't say virtually impossible, but it's a very, very difficult feat. A, a lot more difficult than the odds would imply. So I'd basically be against it's on the line for a starting point. I'd be against uh, Time Leader, obviously finished third in the same race. I then looked at Spyglass Hill, who dogged it out last time out at Haydock. and thought, well, maybe, maybe he might be worth a look. I, w- I then went and watched his round of jumping when he um, unseated rider um in the i think it was the grand septon about two years ago and he jumped absolutely terribly and he almost ran out at the bend at the, at, at the canal turn he just doesn't get very high so on heavy ground i, I couldn't trust him at nine to two i mean if he's ten to one then maybe mm. so once you sort of like get into the nitty-gritty of the, the main three in the market you think well let's take them all on um i've had a few quid here on a gaboro uh, or Gaborio um, from the Oliver Green and Josh Guerriero um, set up. Now, unfortunately, they lost one of their stable stars, if you recall, early on this season, Jess Kill, mm. uh, or Jess Kill, which is a bitter blow for them. They lost him at Cheltenham, which was a, a real sad occasion. Um, but that horse really went a long way to proving that these two guys know exactly what they're doing when it comes to preparing a horse for the Aintree fences. Now, Gaborio's yet to run here at Aintree, but I'm trusting that they've obviously schooled him perhaps over Aintree star fences at home. He does jump really well. And more importantly, um, he stays beyond two mile five, two six. He won over three mile one last time out. He was never any stronger than he was at the finish. He beat a good field that day. There was a bit of depth in that Catrick race. And he's fairly kind of like fresh and young. He's like one of those younger horses at an eight, as an eight-year-old, which has been the trend nowadays. The younger horses seem to be coming through in the point-to-point point, point hunter chase sphere. Um, that, he, that he's got very much got um, age on his side. So he hasn't got many battle scars as quite a few of the rest. He's 11 to 1 currently. Um, I could see him being sort of 7 or 8 to 1. Um, not, he's not going to collapse, but he's definitely not going to be double figures um, come the off. I, I'd see him running well. And, and the other one to mention is Benny's King from the Dan Skelton stable. He won on heavy ground last time at Leicester. He's, he's jumped around here before. He's got a, a prominent race style, which is very much um, complemented by this track. Most of the winners of this race tend to race prominently or, or make all the running. So he he ticks that box as well. So in short, my two against the field are the sort of two floaters just beyond the front three in the market, uh, Gaborio and uh, Benny's King. Gaborio <coughs> is uh, 11 to 1, bet, uh, Victor, Coral, uh, Bet MGM and a couple of others. Uh, Betway with their seven places are eight to one. And uh, who's the other one? Benny's King. And Benny's King, yeah, 17 to two with uh, with William Hill, uh, kind of eight to one, 15 to two uh, market price. Uh, the penultimate race on the cards uh, tomorrow is the Red Rum Handicap Chase, uh, where Unexpected Party is the six to one favourite, uh, another Cheltenham hero landing that skeleton double. Uh, St. Roy, uh, joint favourite at six to one. Path de Rue is 13 to two. Heltonham, eight to one. Uh, Whiskey Wealth, nine to one. Sawn Brew is 11 to one. On Public, 12 to one. With Dancing on My Own, 16 to one bar those, Andy. Yeah, fascinating race. We've got Cheltenham Festival form courtesy uh, of the Grand Annual. Um, trying to stand the test of time. And we've got Lots of horses coming in from all different angles here with different form lines. Um, we've even got a couple of El- uh, Irish Raiders, Whiskey Wealth and Irish Blaze, uh, just to add an extra bit of spice, along with the previous winner of this race, of course, Dancing on My Own uh, from the Henry de Bromhead stable. So a tricky one to get your head around. Um, I certainly wouldn't put you off either one of the skeleton horses. Obviously, the drop back in trip paid dividends with ex- unexpected part. In Heltonham has been one of the most improved chasers in, in recent uh, weeks. Um, he won on heavy ground two runs ago at Newbury over further, so that's not going to be a problem for him, and he's a good cruiser. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if um, either one of those two bolstered Dan Skelton's champion trainer bid. Um, but I'm going to put up one here that I'm probably going to suggest is m- maybe the best bet on the card for me at the prices, and that is Paul Nichols' Sam Bruer, 
Um, ex French horse that has had three runs uh, for Paul Nichols so far. His first two over hurdles didn't amount to a great deal. But last time out back over fences, there was much more like the um, horse that Connections uh, got hold of. Uh, don't forget, he was a good horse over in France. He ran really well in last year's champion, Irish, uh, well, um, French champion hurdle when he finished seventh behind uh, uh, Thelmy. And he had some good horses in and around him that day. Um, but boy, oh boy, did he go well through that Chepstow race the other day. Uh, it was a strongly run event. There was only seven runners, but the time figure that we got suggested it was a, a proper race. Uh, and he just got outstayed on the running by a horse that had won at the track the previous time. Um, he had his pocket picked a little bit. But I think this flatter track will suit him. He gets in there off 10-2. Bryony Foss takes the ride. Mark 130. He's a 150 horse over hurdles. I think he's very, very well handicapped, this Sambrio. He will travel like the wrath of God through this race. The, the faster they go, the better. And we know that he stays beyond two miles, courtesy of the Audis French form. So I really, really like his chances, Sam Brewer. I'll be gutted if he's not in the first four. Sam Brewer, uh, 10 to 1, or 11 to 1 best price with Coral and Labricks, 10 to 1 pretty much across the board elsewhere there. Um, a strongest bet on the card for Andy. Uh, finally, we have the bumper um here where we've got Baby Kate is the 11 to 4 favourite for the Mullins team. Honky Tonk Highway, 5 to 1. Jubilee Alpha, uh, so this is the Mayor's Bumper. Jubilee Alpha, 7 to 1. Uh, Diva Luna, 15 to 2. Uh, 12 to 1 bar those. Uh, Andy, how we've got 18 here. Um, how does Baby Kate stack up on the numbers? Not bad. Um, that Cheltenham bumper that she won um, was one of the better ones. Um, a big, obviously, big field at Cheltenham, etc. The, the numbers are always going to be uh, fairly good. Um, well, he's done okay in this race. He won it with Ashero Diamond a couple of years ago, but he's had a lot of short ones that have failed to hit the target. And I think, he, I think, but in in short, I think Baby Kate's a, a scandalously short price. I don't think she's done a huge amount to, to suggest, certainly on the form anyway, that she should be under three to one. You're yeah, backing basically Willie Mullins and Paddy Mullins here mm. um, more than anything else. I, I think the key form line to this race is a um, a point to point. Um, at a place called, I think it's Tat- Tattersall's Hill or something like that over in Ireland, Tattersall's Farm. Um, it's a race that was won by Honky Tonk Highway and she beat uh, Diva Luna by two lengths. Now, both of these two have uh, gone their separate ways, different ways uh, with trainers and their seasonal reappearances or rules debuts. Honky Tonk Highway won very tidily at Sandown, showing a lot of grit and determination from sort of the last three furlongs onwards. When she looked beat, but the sort of further they went, she, the better she looked. So a test the stamina around here will really suit her from an informed stable. And Diva Luna was just as good when she won at market race. Now she won at listed level that day, so she beat some good horses on the um, at the Lincolnshire track. And she also did it by going all the way around the inside on a day where everything that won had to race off the inside. You you you, you were definitely in the better position running towards the stand side rail. So I kind of upgraded her run on that occasion. And I know Ben Pauling thinks the world of her as well. So I'm just going to play this race fairly straightforwardly. Back both of those two, Honky Tonk Highway, Diva Luna, first and second in that Tattlesall's farm, point to point in Ireland um, from last year. Love that. Uh, five to one Honky Tonk Highway, that's with most firms. And Diva Luna, 15 to two, that is with Coral Skybet. Go five places. Most firms are four. Thank you very much, Andy, for taking your time out of your day to go through Thursday's card. As I say, we'll be recording a day two, so Friday and Saturday for the Grand National uh, tomorrow with Ed Quigley as well. So make sure you subscribe to the Odds Checker YouTube channel where you can find uh, those previews uploaded at some point tomorrow afternoon. Make sure you download the Odds Checker app so you can find the best prices. Bookie offers free bets. Place terms and Andy's tips straight to the app every single morning of racing. Uh, check out the Odds Checker site for all of your race, your betting needs over the course of the weekend as well. Thank you, Andy. We'll speak again tomorrow. No uh, in the meantime, I hope you have a brilliant first day at Aintree, and we'll see you uh, in day two and day three previews. Uh, please ensure that you gamble responsibly.